Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Senator David Waters, and I'm calling into order the Commission on Offshore Wind and Port Development. And our first duty is to read the Right to Know advisory. Um, before we get started, I'll read through a checklist to ensure the meeting that we are holding is in compliance with the Right to Know law. As chair of the commission, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and in accordance with the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to executive order 2020-04 and its extensions, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting, which was authorized pursuant to the governor's order. In accordance with the emergency order, I am confirming that we are providing public access to the meeting by telephone with additional access possible by video and other electronic means. We are utilizing Zoom for this electronic meeting. All members of the committee and selected legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously in this meeting through this platform. And the public has access to contemporaneously watch and or listen to the meeting on YouTube and via phone by following the directions and provided on the general court website. We have provided public notice the necessary information for accessing the Senate calendar. We are providing a mechanism for the public to alert the public body during the meeting if there are problems with access. If anyone has a problem, please email remote senate at state dot nh dot us that's remote senate at ledge dot state dot nh dot us or call six zero three two seven one four three it's six zero three two seven one three zero four three in the event the public is unable to access, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. Please note that all votes taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. Finally, let's start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance. When each member states their presence, please also state where they are and if anyone else, and the right to know does, does not require pets be included, is in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. So, uh, Mark, if you could please call the roll. Okay, great. <clears throat> Senator David Waters. I am here alone in my room in Dover. All right. Senator Jeb Bradley. Representative Jane Bolio. Uh, I'm here at home in Manchester, um, and a friend may be coming in anytime. Representative Catherine Harvey. I can see her, I just can't hear her. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I didn't unmute. Um, I'm here, I'm in my home, and my husband may be in and out. Excellent. All right, Representative Peter Somsich. Uh Yes, I'm present, and I'm in my home, and uh, my wife is nearby, but she's in and out. Okay. Representative Rennie Cushing. Not here. Um, Matt Mayo. I am here uh, at the State House in Concord and I am alone. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Caswell, since I don't see him, uh, I'm the alternate. My name is Mark Will Liberty. Uh, I'm in my home in Candia by myself. Um, Ted Deers. Yeah, this is Ted Deers. I'm at home in Concord by myself. <laughs> and I also see uh, Stephen Kuchar is here as well. Yes. I'm here in Chester, New Hampshire uh, by myself. Okay. Uh, Diane Martin. Hi, I'm here and I'm in Deerfield, New Hampshire alone. All right. Sherry Patterson. Good afternoon. I'm present and I'm in my office alone. Donald Kreese. Gino Marconi. Michael Behrman. Yes, I'm here in Dover and alone. Uh, Diane Foster. I'm here, I'm home alone, but my daughter and husband may wander in at, at the house at one point. Okay. Uh, Sean Clancy. 
I'm making sure I say this right. Jim Titone. I'm here in Seabrook and I am alone. Awesome. Ward Byrne. Tony Junta. Hi, yes, I am here alone at my home in Franklin. Joe Casey. Glenn Brackett. All right, make sure I say this right. Vanden Devadia. Yes, Vanden Devadia, I'm here alone in my home office. Thank you. Tim Roach. And I never can say anything. Jennifer Sizz. You got it. Uh, Jen says, and I am in my office in Rochester alone. There, there it is, Senator. Well, thank you so much, everyone. And our first order of business will be the minutes from the previous meeting. And I believe they were sent out a couple of weeks ago from uh, Jen Gallagher, my aide. And I think Mark has uh, just resent them to the commission remembers as well. So if you want to pull those up and if you've taken a, a look at them and so on. And uh, thank you, Mark, for this thorough recounting of our business last time. And uh, I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes. Tony Junta, Mr. Chair, I so move. Uh, thank you, and a second? I'll second. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And are there any additions or corrections or comments? Hearing none, uh, Mark, if you could please read the roll for the All vote. Right. Okay. Um, and I'll just do the people who I know are here. Senator Waters? Yes. Um, Michael Behrman? Yes. Um, I'm, I say yes. Uh, Matt Mayu? Yes. Representative Bolio? Yes. Representative Harvey? Can't hear her again. Um, we'll go back to her. I'm getting to unmute, yes. Okay. Representative Somsich? Yes. Ted Deers? Yes. Diane Martin? Yes. Diane Foster? <coughs> yes. Jim Titone? Yes. Tony Junta? Yes. Vanden Devadia? Yes. Jennifer Sizz? Yes. And Sherry Patterson? Yes. And Stephen Kutcher, you were here at the last meeting, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Uh, correct, but Ted's the primary, so. But he wasn't there at the last meeting. That's why I ask. Uh, then yes. Okay. Okay, well, thank you so much, uh, Mark. And um, if you look to the agenda, we had thought that it would be a good idea to focus an early meeting on uh, port infrastructure. And uh, so I'm very grateful to Jay Borkland, who Michael will introduce in more, uh, at more, in more detail in just a moment. Um, we had hoped to have uh, Gina Marconi with us today, be, but because of a, a personal matter, he couldn't uh, be with us today, but we will certainly have him, uh, I hope, for the next uh, meeting. So this will give us kind of a, a sense of what kinds of facilities are needed for offshore wind development and then where we are at in New Hampshire uh, at this time as well. We also today will go over um, a list of potential topics and a sequence for them that the steering committee has worked on uh, and to get your comments and discussion. So you have a little sense of the roadmap of where we are going. <laughs> I just will comment that I, I think you know, I've been on some recent calls uh, and meetings on offshore wind and I think the prospects are looking very bright for renewed investment in, in interest um, and the hopes that the vineyard, uh, the, the vineyard uh, project will be approved fairly um, shortly and that will kind of um, turn the eyes again of, uh, of NOAA and others uh, towards the Gulf of Maine. And so I think that we are gonna be very well situated in the work of this commission as we are moving along through these, through these topics. Um, so uh, I will turn it over to Michael. And again, thanks to Michael for uh, arranging for Mr. Borkland to be with us. Perfect, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think this is going to be a very good discussion. Uh, as, as the Senator had noted, um, you know, we've, this is a big issue. We have a lot of time to dig into this further. Um, uh, and as you'll find out 
Um, Mr. Borkman is a very experienced individual, but we, we will dig more into sort of details of our port, um, what that means, current condition, uh, what, you know, where we may be going with this issue on ports. But uh, I think Mr. Borkman will be able to give a, a very good broad uh, perspective on the types of ports out there, uh, kind of the experience to this point from an international standpoint, uh, through to what's happened in the U.S. with different ports and the positions. So with that, uh, Jay Borkland is uh, with Lloyd's Registry, and he's the Renewable Energy Lead for the Americas. He's a senior scientist and engineer with special expertise in permitting and consenting on a myriad of federal, state, and local large-scale marine, environmental, and infrastructure projects along the coastline uh, and around the world, including the offshore industry, currently developing off the U.S. East Coast. He has, a, uh, has deep connections in the U.S. and international offshore wind industry and is a visiting professor at Tufts University, chairman of the board of directors of the Business Network for Offshore Wind and Lloyd Register representative for the United Nations Global Compact Sustainable Ocean Business Action Platform. Uh, so with that, I did see that Jay is on right now. And uh, Jay, if you'd like, um, please feel free to share your screen at your convenience and we'll, we'll get started. Okay, thank you, Michael. Thank you, uh, committee uh, and senators. Uh, I really appreciate this opportunity to share uh, with you <clears throat> um, this uh, presentation. Um, I am uh, just sharing now and uh, need to uh, get this into slideshow mode and we'll be ready to go. Also, ju just a quick note for everybody, um, unless you're speaking, if you wouldn't mind just muting your mic. Um, and then I believe just from conversation with, with Jay that uh, there'll be a couple of times within this presentation, which um, will be probably you know, a bit lengthier than the last presentations we had at our prior meeting. Um, but there'll be some opportunities within the presentation to stop, ask some questions, um, and have a little Q&A, and then proceed to sort of the next section. So uh, thank you. Okay. Can everyone hear me and see my screen? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much again for this opportunity. Um, it, it's, it's very exciting um, to me to be able to, to speak to you. I've been living the uh, ports issues for offshore wind since around 2010 in the United States. Um, as Michael mentioned, um, I am currently the senior engineering manager for Lloyd's Register. I'm also um, at, on the faculty at Tufts University as a visiting scholar and do research in offshore wind. And I'm a member of an international um, research consortium called Power US that is related to offshore wind through my Tufts connections. Um, I'm also on the, uh, the president of the board of directors for the Business Network for Offshore Wind, which is the largest network for a trade organization for offshore wind in the US. And also am Lloyd's Register's um, member of the uh, United Nations Global Compact related to offshore renewable energy. And all of those things um, are related in that they all tie into offshore renewable energy and offshore wind. And um, it, it means that I have seen a, a fair, a very broad cross section of what's happening both in the US globally and in our region um, with offshore wind. And so I'm hoping to share some of that experience and background with you today. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to um, take a little bit of a, a tour here um, since we have a little bit of extra time on, on this particular uh, day to um, really kind of dive into sort of what's the industry overview as it relates to ports. Um, so kind of the first part of this will be um, offshore wind industry 101, um, a little bit of a primer on floating offshore wind, a look at the New Hampshire ports, um, and then um, a quick analysis of, of some of the financing and the financial outcomes that come from offshore wind. Um, just to uh, give a quick overview of uh, the organization that I'm part of, Lloyd's Register, is uh, the 260-year-old original ship classification society. Um, we are a, uh, a, um, a, um, a charity 
Uh, all profits go to charity. We were founded in the Lloyd's Coffee House in London. So it all started with a cup of coffee. And we have the registry for essentially all of the ships that have been created. That's how we got into the offshore wind world was through our maritime connections um, with uh, both ships and ports and offshore wind. Um, we have a pretty broad reach um, showing the global connections. And one of the interesting things that um, we have is we have a lot of insight into what's happening globally in offshore wind. Um, the other organizations that I mentioned, uh, the Business Network for Offshore Wind has published um, extensively and you have heard from them um, about offshore wind in New Hampshire. Um, they are the industry um, group that's uh, pretty much central to all uh, information that is disseminated on offshore wind in the US. Uh, the United Nations, um, hopefully you've heard of, and uh, the Global Compact is the, um, is the, the, um, the, the uh, private wing, shall we say, of corporations that are sustain uh, providing sustainability initiatives for the Global Compact. And there's a couple of um, uh, uh, publications um, that I was involved with that are uh, really useful for offshore wind. One is the Ocean Stewardship 2030, which uh, provides context for governments in looking at offshore wind. And the other is Sustainable Ocean Principles, which talks for, for among other things about how um, offshore wind and offshore renewable energy need to integrate with all of the other users in the ocean. So that is obviously very important. And then Power US is um, a research um, group that is working in offshore wind. Um, Tufts University um, was the, one of the founding members um, along with Woods Hole Oceanographic. And it's something that uh, potentially uh, the University of New Hampshire might wanna look into or some of the other institutions that are in uh, New Hampshire that are looking to educate in the area of offshore wind. Um, so I just wanted to kind of give you uh, some context here. Um, I apologize if this is um, uh, review for a lot of you, but um, uh, I think just sort of starting at the beginning doesn't hurt. Um, Today, the largest offshore wind farms in the water, the, the largest one is the Walney. And it's the largest at 659 megawatts. Um, Block Island went into the water in uh, 2017 in the US. That's a 30 megawatt um, uh, offshore wind farm. But Vineyard Wind One, when it starts up uh, in 2022, is a 800 megawatt capacity. So what the US is doing is it is going to add capacity in large chunks to catch up with the rest of the world. Um, the, uh, the, where we are at the US today, um, not that long ago, offshore wind seemed like it was way over the horizon. Uh, in 2015, you can see what someone was willing to pay for an offshore wind lease, $281,000. Uh, in 2018, just three years later, um, one Massachusetts lease area went for $135 million. So that's a 480% increase in three years. And that means that there's extreme interest that is growing dramatically. So here we see that um, in, the, in a chart. Um, we are of course here around 2020. Um, and uh, right now with uh, just about uh, 40 megawatts of capacity installed in the US in a couple of pilot projects. But if you look at where we will be in 2022, 2023, 2024, as a series of projects come online up and down the coast, we're heading toward 35 gigawatts by 2035. That's a significant amount of our energy being provided. Um, and if you look at how much of that will is projected to be floating, in this graph you see the seabed fixed, which um, is the, the, um, the principal um, set of installation parameters that uh, is being assumed right now for most of offshore wind. But um, floating is, is coming along quickly. And as you can see, uh, if you get out to uh, years 25, 26, 27, floating starts to take uh, an effect in uh, the US offshore wind paradigm and it becomes a significant amount by the time we get to um, you know, 2030, 2035. Um, and th this, is, this, um, this is globally, but um, it, in uh, the US it's expected to mimic this overall pattern. Um, and so um, 
the, the offshore wind leases, as you are probably aware, um, are up and down the East Coast. Um, there's a variety of them. There's 19 um, project areas that are being tracked by BOEM. And then there's a series of call areas that are coming up, um, which are in the New York Bight, the Carolinas, and then the Gulf of Maine, of course, for which the reason why we're, we're here talking. Um, some of, several things go into thinking about offshore wind ports. And one thing not to be forgotten about is the vessels and the, uh, the vessel, um, uh, um, the, the uh, vessel, oops, sorry, um, the, the, uh, the kinds of vessels that are used and the fact that the vessels are, uh, are transforming over time and they're transforming very rapidly. So not long ago, there was only a few vessels in the world that could handle um, shipping and installing an offshore wind farm. And now there are hundreds of vessels and they're getting larger and they are carrying more and more components and more and more people. And that is a direct, has a direct effect on what kinds of ports can be utilized for offshore wind. Um, the other technology that's developing that's impacting the, court, the ports is <clears throat> the size of the components. So um, with the advent of the GE coming along with its 12 megawatt turbine, um, this, this uh, is a giant machine. Uh, the blades are, are giant. Um, you see here one of the blades is, um, this is one of the GE Halliad X blades. Uh, that was sent to um, Boston, Massachusetts for its uh, for testing uh, at the um, Mass Clean Energy Center offshore wind blade testing facility, which you see in the in the middle picture. Um, this blade is uh, over 320 feet long, so it is the size of a football field for one blade. Um, the um, piece of equipment you see on the right is the nacelle that will handle this blade. The blade is connected to this hub section. This is the part that spins and creates the energy. Um, the, uh, the surface area of this is, is like having three football fields spinning in the air, um, if you can vision that. So these uh, components have gotten extremely large. And so they cannot be shipped in and out um, through in a production sense in just any port. And so there are special requirements and special attributes that the ports need to have. Um, <clears throat> so um, the, the future of offshore wind is floating in, in many different um, ways, and it certainly is uh, floating for the Gulf of Maine, since the water depths and the conditions there um, really um, sort of dictate the need for the use of floating um, offshore wind. So um, they, the first task force, of course, was in December of 2019, and uh, the projected timeline for the development of the Gulf of Maine lease areas is over the next five to 10 years. Um, the water depth is considered deep um, when compared with uh, the fixed bottom offshore wind uh, facilities in the in the lower 40 in the in the state south of um, New Hampshire. And um, the foundation types that'll be needed are floating, of which there are several, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and of course, in 2020, 2020, the main Aquaventus project, um, which is the sort of the first floating project to be um, commissioned in the US, to be commissioned to be designed and built in the US, has been green lighted. And so um, that's the start. So the Gulf of Maine gets to kick off floating offshore wind in the US. Um, now to take a look at the difference. Um, so everyone has heard a lot about how offshore wind is, is coming from Europe and how it'll be developed in, you know, in a way that is consistent with the way that Europe developed. And I think that the US is beginning to have an overprint of its own character um, on the industry here in the US. Yes, the, most of the developers and most of the components are still European, um, however, the fact of the matter is, is that the port facilities in the US are, that are available for offshore wind are quite a bit different than the port facilities in Europe. This particular uh, port is called the Port of Espierg in Denmark. Um, it has a gigantic laydown area and receiving area 
and uh, several wind farms can be marshaled out of this part, port. This is um, over a thousand acres of waterfront land. Um, and it is, has a key side that's over um, 4,000 feet long. Um, so this is sort of the, the muscle port uh, in Europe. This is sort of the way that the European ports have developed where they call, they're called mega ports. And they tend to have manufacturing as well as storage and what's called marshalling. Marshalling is just the place where all the components are brought to be put together and go out to the wind farm. So they, they marshal the components. And so in Europe, there's this concept of these very large um, port facilities. In the US, um, the port facilities for offshore wind, uh, there, there just is not that much land that's available um, on the waterfront. There's a, it's very rare to have thousands of acres available on the waterfront that's not already in use or not already in uh, private hands. And so um, the port facility strategy in the US is expected to be what we call a distributed ports network. So yes, you may need hundreds of acres to for all the aspects of offshore wind, but they don't necessarily all need to be in one port. And so that means that uh, ports in the US will likely become specialized in terms of how they're used. Um, this particular port is the port of New Bedford, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, it is the, the first and currently the only purpose-built offshore wind port in the U.S., in New Bedford, Massachusetts. It's about 30 acres in size. Um, it, it will be expanded probably a little bit, but we're still talking about a 30 to a 50-acre port as opposed to a 1,000-acre port. And uh, what's, what should be hopeful for New Hampshire is that um, the fact that this this is a this port has great efficacy, um, both um, vineyard wind and Mayflower wind have signed on to marshal their projects um, out of this port facility. So it is now busy starting in 2021 through 2026, um, and, and it is going to be used as the main marshaling port for for those projects. Um, and it is um, while there are certain limitations due to its size. Um, because it's been specially built, it has a lot of advantages over other port facilities. So now just kind of looking at um, what's going to be needed in the ports. What, what's your future look like in terms of can you play? Um, and one, one thing one, all one needs to do is look at the number of projects that are being commissioned um, or are, are coming online over the next uh, 10 to 15 years and how many ports are going to be needed in order to um, to, to build those, um, those offshore wind farms. And what you see in this graph is um, a, uh, a, a graph of the, um, the projected number of turbines that are gonna be put in the water each year in the US East Coast. So in, uh, we're talking about anywhere from 200 to 400 turbines going in the water each year between 2022 and 2035. Um, in order to service all those ports and I mean, all those wind farms, there needs to be somewhere between six and eight ports, um, around six or seven ports um, to, to service all those. And so right now there's one. So there's plenty of room for additional ports to come into play. And this is just looking at the marshalling ports. Um, as I said before, uh, the ports will be distributed um, between different types uh, in the US and so manufacturing ports added to the six or eight needed to this is another eight to 12. Uh, and then on top of that, um, there are service ports and O&M ports, which is another six or eight. So we'll probably be looking at about 30 ports up and down the East Coast that'll be brought into use for offshore wind. Um, where will these ports be? Um, so this is a map, uh, we, we at Lloyd's Register have done an analysis of all the ports on the East Coast um, that could be a part of the um, offshore wind sector. Uh, and the little orange dots you see on the left are all the port facilities that are in play off of the, um, associated with the offshore wind areas. Um, and there's about a hundred ports or so um, that could be brought into play if you include all the different types of ports. And um, uh, as you get up into the Northeast, 
um, you see that there's ports in New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and potentially up in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Um, and, and then there are there's a couple in Maine that um, uh, Sears Port, which has been brought into the um, into the fold as well as a potential offshore wind port. So this is sort of the family of ports. Now, if, if we start looking at what is the anatomy of what needs to go into these ports, how do they need to be built so that they can allow the, the offshore wind industry to build out uh, and to build its wind farms? Um, I'm gonna use an example, um, the port in, in New Bedford. Um, I was the, uh, the lead for the design team, the permitting and the construction oversight for the state of Massachusetts and Mass Clean Energy Center for this project. This project was set up um, for, um, to, to make Massachusetts um, a, a leader for offshore wind. Um, and of course they've succeeded, as I mentioned, they've signed on a couple of uh, the, the wind farm operators. Um, this uh, facility was a beach, uh, it was undeveloped property at the south end of the harbor in New Bedford. Um, and one of the things that we had to do first off was to install these very uh, solid, these things are called coffer dams, this, this lineal uh, set of steel circles. Uh, they look like uh, coffee cans that you kind of pound into the ground and connect to each other. And what those do is they provide the extreme load bearing capacity um, application or, or allowance for the site. So um, all of this soil that's placed behind this needs to be heavily compacted, but this is the, this is the wall. This is the, the thing that allows the, the heavy loads to be lifted by this um, facility. So those giant turbines that I showed you um, with, with the GE turbines and the blades, uh, the turbines can, can weigh between 20 and 50 tons each. Um, and uh, each one of those is, um, needs to be lifted by a crane that weighs about the same and then has to have a counterbalance. So we're talking about a hundred tons or so of the of weight being on the on the cranes. Um, these facilities, um, this particular facility was designed to 20,000 pounds per square foot foot load bearing capacity. That may not mean much to you, um, but 20,000 pounds is about 10 times the normal loading of a normal, port in the US. So if you have a container port or an auto port, though the load bearing is usually between two and 4,000 pounds per square foot. This is designed for a point load of 20,000 pounds per square foot and a, an average load over the site of 6,000. So these ports uh, need to, to handle extreme um, con uh, capacity. And um, the way that we did it here in New Bedford was to install this kind of a, a bulkhead system at the at the uh, at the, uh, the the water side, and then on top of this was put a concrete. It's called a relieving platform, um, and then the site was all graded. What you see in this picture down here, which is from a 2017 Civil Engineering Magazine review of the project, um, is the finished product with some offshore wind components sitting on it. Now in this particular picture, this was a small wind farm that the components were being um, brought in for. This is the vessel um, that brought the components in from Europe. Um, but in a normal um, offshore wind farm installation, there'll be, be as many as 50 pieces of components that are in here. And I like to talk about the, the, um, the, the flow of components that go through a port as, as being analogous to a, the, a ballet of the giant components. So it's a giant ballet where pieces have to come in from Europe or from wherever they're, they're made. It could be made in the US, but they have to come in, they need to be handled, they need to be put on vessels, and then they need to go out to the wind farm. So this is for fixed bottom now um, type foundation. So the, there's, there'll be a nuance when we get to floating. And um, I want to talk to you about that because that obviously that nuance is what is going to make New Hampshire and Maine and Northern Massachusetts for that matter, those ports um, um, really um, uh, able to play. Um, just kind of looking at the pantheon of ports that are being developed right now um, up and down the coast. Um, these will be to some extent, the competitors to any ports in New Hampshire 
that might be developed um, from a general sense, but also opportunities for collaboration. Uh, and you can, you, I could envision that there could be parts built in New Hampshire that could be sent to these uh, ports. Some of those parts might be uh, useful for both floating and fixed. They may be universal, such as blades. And in that sense, um, they could be uh, manufactured in New Hampshire and sent to some of these other ports where they'd be marshaled. Um, but there's uh, Providence has a series of ports. Um, the Arthur Kill Terminal in Staten Island is um, a port that's on the drawing board that would uh, handle, uh, because it's it near the open ocean with no bridges, could handle the largest ships um, and the, can handle components in the vertical. Um, this is one way that um, uh, offshore wind shippers like to ship is in this vertical um, condition. Um, the port in New Bedford, uh, the Marine Commerce Terminal, which I just showed you the construction of, um, the port of Esbjerg is um, marshalling port uh, just for comparison. Um, so this sort of shows the same kind of use, but Esbjerg is, is much larger um, than these other ports in the US. Um, so um, to sort of talk about the different kinds of ports that are used and needed for offshore wind, whether you're talking about fixed or whether you're talking about floating. So um, there are the staging and manufacturing ports. Um, which uh, we talked about a bit about staging where all the components are combined to make the, the final uh, pieces for the offshore wind farm and then are sent out to the installation area to be uh, put together. Or in the case of floating, they may be put together at the quayside and then towed out to the, to the offshore wind area. Um, there's several different types of marshaling ports that have been developed. Um, and are being developed, including some in New York, where some of the large gravity-based foundations at the Port of Coimans. This is a very similar operation to what might happen in uh, New Hampshire, where the um, the foundations. Th this is a uh, this is all in planning yet. They haven't built any foundations yet in the Port of Coimans, but they are. Um, they do have a project and they are uh, going to be um, planning on developing these gravity-based concrete foundations, which they manufacture on the shore, and then they lift them into the water and they float, and they float them down the Hudson River and then out to where they'll be installed at the wind farm. Um, and so, the, but these, uh, a lot of these different components, um, you, you can have uh, marshaling ports that um, are also used for uh, manufacturing and staging. Um, there's an O&M port, which is um, uh, highly um, advantageous to, to, acquire, to be the a port selected for a marshalling port, I mean, for a, an O&M uh, or service port, because th while the marshalling ports are in operation during the construction of the wind farm, it's usually a three to four year period um, for each wind farm that the, that port is in, in play. And then there may be downtimes in between when um, successive wind farms may be built that the port might not be fully utilized if it's a marshaling port. But for an O&M port, O&M port is consistent use. Uh, it is operation and maintenance as the name uh, suggests. Um, and it is the facilities upon which the, the, um, the main crew will go out to maintain and operate the wind farm. Um, it'll have the electronics uh, in it as well that manage the wind farm. Um, so you see in the center of the picture, um, that's the electronic board with the operators uh, operating the, the power station that is the wind farm. Uh, and then um, the kinds of vessels that are used to take workers out to the wind farms. Um, and that's why they kind of call it a rally port in some cases where, um, it's really just a place to park the vessels. Uh, the, the workers come and get on the vessels and go out to do their work. So they rally at, at that certain location. There's a couple of different kinds of vessels that are used for operation and maintenance. Um, the smaller vessels here in the foreground, these are called crew transfer vessels. So these are the, the vessels that go out daily um, to the wind farm. They take crew out daily to do maintenance, um, to do inspections and to do minor repairs. Um, if the wind farm is within a certain distance, and usually it's about 50 to 100 nautical miles of the, of the O&M base, 
Um, for wind farms that are farther out, um, these larger vessels that you see over here, this is in the Port of Hull. This is Orsted's facility in the Port of Hull. These are called service operation vehicles. Um, they have more capacity to do more things and do more repairs. They also are essentially hotel ships and they don't go out every day. They may go out weekly, they may go out monthly, but the crew gets on these vessels and they go out to the wind farm. For those vessels, um, uh, the, the uh, operation, uh, you might do a, a, a weekly cycle or a month on month off type timing for the workers. Um, but those are uh, vessels that keep the work crew for an extended period of time out in the wind farm so that they have, don't spend as much time in transit and can just uh, concentrate on, on doing the, the, um, the uh, work that they need to do. Um, so the situation in the US, there are, as I said, a, a series of ports. Um, many of them are, or all of them are under development now or not developed. Um, except for Massachusetts, New Bedford, which is which is fully developed. Um, there, uh, this port here in New London, Connecticut, is supposed to start construction next year. Um, Arthur Kill is still working on its um, plans and its financial stack. Uh, Prob Port and South Key are coming along in Rhode Island, um, and but they, as you can see from this picture, um, there's there's a fair bit to do to get it ready. So it's it's a year or so out from being ready. And then Brayton Point has been brought in. That's another Massachusetts port. It's been bought, brought in, um, but it's a multi-use port. And I think that's one of the things that is um, of interest here is that if you have a port that's used for, for things other than offshore wind at the same time, um, then you have to be able to share the key side and you have to have enough land area for offshore wind to be able to work and for you to be able to do those other things that you do. In this, in this case, they do you know, steel and, and bulk composite um, material. So um, shifting now to talk a little bit about floating offshore wind and, and what it looks like and what it's, what it's going to look like. It is a developing technology. So far, there are really only pilot projects uh, that have been developed. Um, we've been involved in a number of those pilot projects, including um, the, the Aquaventus project and um, the SPAR projects in, um, in Europe, uh, as well as some of these float gen projects here in terms of looking at certifying some of the, some of the aspects. Um, so floating is really um, utilized when you get to deeper water and it's more, and it's too, and it's cost prohibitive or, or logistically difficult to install something and fix it to the bottom of the ocean. So you can't drive a monopile or put, a, a, um, a, a large, um, what they call a jacket foundation. It looks like the, the kind of erector set type of foundation um, in, in water that's deeper than about 60 meters, uh, which is uh, you know about uh, 180 feet. Um, so as you get to um, the, the 150 foot range, that's when people start thinking about floating. And that's one of the reasons why in the Gulf of Maine, um, you know, eyes are pointing toward the um, type of installations that will happen in New Hampshire and Maine or off of New Hampshire and Maine uh, to be primarily floating. Um, there are a few areas that are shallow enough to put um, um, fixed. And so it's possible that a mixture of fixed and floating um, could occur in New Hampshire, which is why I thought it was interesting to be able to explain and share what the, the port facilities for fixed look like as well. First of all, there's a lot of uh, correlative activity. And then second of all, it's quite possible that the Gulf of Maine may have kind of a hybrid approach. Um, although most people are talking floating and pretty much floating consistently. So with floating, um, there are some really interesting opportunities at uh, the ports. Because, because it is a floating structure, uh, it, it is possible to build it in the water at a quayside um, using a, um, what they call an elevator barge, but essentially build it either on land um, and then um, on rails. These are very, very heavy um, uh, 
uh, structures, but you could build it on rails and then slide it out onto these things that are called elevator barges. The elevator barges basically have piles or what well, they call them spuds that go down into the water to the bottom. And then the, the barge can be, um, can be submerged. So it can lower that, um, that uh, caisson down into the water until it floats out. These things are meant to float. Um, that's why it's called floating. And so they can be built on land and then put in the water and floated away from the, um, from the quayside. So um, that has an advantage over some of the, the fixed with all those marshalling. You, know, you remember I, I said you need lots of acres uh, to work on. You can um, operate in a smaller footprint with floating if you have a production train that allows several of these foundations to be worked on at one time and be put into the water one after the other. Um, and so that's, that's a consideration in looking at the port facilities in um, the, um, <clears throat> the New Hampshire coastline. Um, I'm borrowing a, um, I've got a little vignette here of a, uh, a, a floating offshore wind um, 101 from a colleague of mine at Lloyd's Register, Mark Spring. Mark is kind of considered the, the, the godfather of, of floating offshore wind. He's been working in it for many, many years, a former uh, GE person now with um, LR. Uh, and he's sort of put together kind of a brilliant little um, PowerPoint presentation. So I thought I'd just kind of slide into this for a minute. Um, most of the floating technology comes from adaptation from the oil and gas sector. So um, floating drilling platforms, floating production platforms, uh, floating electrical transformer platforms have been utilized in the energy sector for many, many years, in fact, many decades. And um, it's, it's from that experience that offshore wind is taking its, um, its floating foundation development um, history from. Uh, and so all of these across the top are oil and gas platforms that are floating platforms that have, that have been used, you know, as far back as 1976 and even 1961. This one is no longer in the water, but it is, um, you know, floating uh, platform. And so um, the, the technology, the idea of doing energy from a floating platform offshore is not new, but the connection with all of the cables and making the, uh, these very, very tall turbines work um, and not um, skew as the, as the tides and the wind and the, and the waves um, are affecting the foundation is the trick. And so um, in development are a lot of different kinds of offshore wind. On the far left here, you see a spar. This is the high wind demo spar. A spar means it's just, this is a long, long tube that goes below the, um, the turbine, um, it's, it can be hundreds of feet long and it provides buoyancy um, as, a, as a spar, as a, um, as a long tube that's in the water. There is no big um, you know, three pronged floating uh, foundation or, or floating hull below it. It's just a long tube. It's very stable. Um, but as you can imagine, it's very hard to put in the water and to move to an area because you have to have three or 400 feet of water below you in order to put this in. And so this particular one was um, shipped horizontally and then uprighted in a fjord in Norway uh, by some large cranes and then towed out to where it uh, was commissioned. Um, the more traditional um, or, or and newer foundation types are either these triangular uh, trimaran type um, foundations or these square um, barge type floating foundations. Um, so uh, in that case, we're looking at um, kind of the convergence of the different floating technologies. Uh, and one of the considerations in putting them in is what it takes to, um, what, the, what the ports need to look like. Um, in this case, we have, you know, sort of the, uh, the demo here from, um, from Aquaventus. Uh, we've got some other uh, demonstration foundations that you can kind of see the different um, elements. Um, what's happening now <laughs> is things are moving toward the, um, these are all steel hulls, 
but they are moving um, toward concrete as well. The benefit of concrete, and one of the reasons that that's happening is because um, building these steel hulls in a production capacity is limited in ports all around the world, not just in the US. And so if you can incorporate or build these, um, these um, floating foundations out of concrete or incorporate concrete into it, you have a much broader range of port uses or port applications where you can do the concrete. And so that's something that New Hampshire should be uh, keeping a close eye on um, because if some of these floating foundation technologies um, are, uh, you know, sort of float to the surface, pardon the pun, um, in, in the Gulf of Maine, um, then that means that um, there, it's much easier for local adaptation. Um, concrete and rebar are something that you know, people can, can do anywhere in, in the East Coast. And uh, it is certainly something that could be done out of um, the uh, ports in New Hampshire. Um, this is kind of just a picture of the different technologies for the, the different shapes for the, the different floating platforms. Um, I, I won't get into the mooring systems too much other than to say um, that there are a lot of different mooring systems for these. I know that you have heard a lot about the impacts of the different mooring systems on um, other industries. Um, the one thing I would say, and that we know, is that as the, the, the technology developers are developing the different kinds of foundations, um, they're also looking at the mooring systems. And um, I would say at the moment that the emphasis from the technology developers is on the concrete and steel structures that float, and that they're sort of not spending as much time in being innovative about the um, mooring systems. And I think that that's something that New Hampshire and the Gulf of Maine offshore wind area could have some real impact on by um, pushing the technology developers to really look at the kind of foundations that can work in both the water depth and um, be as um, as, as low impact on other industries and the environment as possible. So things like these tension leg, <coughs> excuse me, these tension leg platforms or these tension leg uh, mooring with, <coughs> where they're certainly essentially straight underneath the, um, the platforms, the, the floating platforms are, are very useful. Um, so the interesting thing about um, floating is um, it has the ability to, to be towed for uh, long distances. Um, right now, um, there are um, components that are being built in Southern Europe that are uh, intended for use in Northern Europe. Um, uh, pulling these things 1400 miles while they're you know, fully erect and then um, mooring them up and connecting them is not out of the question. That means that the ports, so if, if um, the port of, ports in New Hampshire were to get involved with some of the aspects of floating offshore wind um, manufacturing, they uh, and or fabrication and develop they those um, it could have um, application to a broader cross section than just the Gulf of Maine, and um, it does look like the floating will become. Uh, I think the the latest thoughts in the academic community is is that floating isn't just for deep water anymore. It's not just for the Gulf of Maine, not just for California, but once the initial shallow installations occur off the continental shelf in the US as the water gets deeper and the cost, the levelized cost of energy or the cost of putting the floating in comes down um, that you'll see um, hybrid wind farms that may have floating in deeper water and fixed bottom in shallower water, even in off the Massachusetts wind area, the New York wind area, or the Virginia and Carolina wind areas. So it's not beyond the pale that um, ports that get involved in floating offshore wind in New Hampshire could be um, assisting and, and providing content for wind farms down the coast. So it's certainly exciting to be getting involved in the uh, Gulf of Maine offshore wind area for New Hampshire. Um, but uh, it's also got a, a potentially broader application. Um, if you look at um, the scaling on where things are going with the cost, um, what's coming down uh, the quickest, um, you, you, you see that all of the technologies are, are coming down in cost with time as they come into development. There'll come a point where floating offshore wind is the same cost or less 
than um, fixed. That's pretty apparent the way the trends are going. And um, it, it is going to be a popular method for utilizing um, the, the offshore wind. Because we're in uh, the early stages of development with floating, um, th there's some very interesting uh, types of, um, of applications. Um, some people are, are thinking, okay, are we going to try and put that giant 12 megawatt GE turbine um, on a floating foundation and tow that around and then moor it? Or could there be a two turbine, smaller six megawatt um, units that still provide 12 megawatts of power, but you don't have the, the very tall, very heavy and cumbersome um, um, uh, technology? Um, right now, I, I can say pretty much without exception that most of the floating offshore wind foundation developers are looking at something that looks like on the left here, um, where they have a, a foundation with the large turbine rather than a two turbine. But this just demonstrates that there is still innovation that is occurring within the industry. Um, here are the players in offshore and floating offshore wind. So uh, it is not uh, as if there are not a few uh, players that are getting into it. A lot of the investors are seeing the uh, opportunity for investing blue bond money in floating. Um, up the middle here, you sort of see the different uh, companies and, and projects that are, the, and, and uh, types of foundations, the Ideal from France um, foundation type, uh, the Hexacon, uh, Try. These are all the names of the different technologies that are being applied, uh, but these are all the players. So um, it's confusing at the moment because there's a lot of players uh, in the, in the field and there's a lot of different technologies, but it, it is going to start to um, weed its way out as um, floating starts to, to take off in Europe. Um, so the, the material from scaling, um, uh, steel versus uh, concrete, um, that really is, is a big question and that's gonna be determined more by what the port facilities are that can handle this than um, the, the construction applications. Um, so I wanted to pause there and see if there were questions related to sort of the, before I get, the next thing I'm gonna do now is get into the ports in New Hampshire and just kind of go through and talk a little bit about how they might um, play or, or, or how that might, um, what it might look like if New Hampshire started to get into to offshore wind. Well, th thank you so much, Jay. And, um... I don't know whether to call you professor, president, or director. So I'm just going to call you Jay. If that's Jay possible. is perfect. Jay is what I love. I prefer. So thank you. Uh, My father was Mr. Borkland. So. so helpful and full of information. And um, I think that I can't really get an eye too well on who has a question. So I would just hope people could unmute and uh, go identify themselves and ask. I have a question. It's Diane Martin. Yes. You mentioned the tension leg mooring. Is that been um, installed anywhere? And if so, where? And has it been successful? Um, so they, they, they've been installed in terms of um, oil and gas platforms um, around the world, and they have been successful. Um, the, there's a slightly different application, obviously. Um, but that is something the, the tension leg platforms are, or uh, mooring systems are something that show uh, a fair amount of application. Um, at, at this moment, um, for the application to offshore wind, they are being, um, uh, there isn't as much focus on them as one might hope, given the fact that um, for, the, for the Gulf of Maine in particular, um, but even a lot of areas where there are other industries that are heavily using the, the waterways, um, that the tension leg type um, solution uh, will uh, reduce the footprint of the, uh, of the floating offshore wind platform. Um, there are some limitations to water depth right now, and that's something that uh, more research needs to be put into that. And so that, that's an area that I think um, you know, as New Hampshire looks at its place in offshore wind um, and, and in floating offshore wind, it has the opportunity 
um, as does you know Maine and, and Northern Massachusetts here as a as a group to um, have an impact on how the 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 field develops and uh, can really become you know what amounts to kind of world leading in that um, thought process. So um, right now there is uh, not a lot of tension leg. Um, it, it's kind of an afterthought when you talk to offshore wind floating developers at the moment, um, because they're focusing on their floating technology on the, on the hull foundations and where they marry that to the, the top side. Um, and they're not focusing right now so much on the moorings, but once they turn their attention to that and begin to realize that the mooring systems are going to be key to you know getting approvals and and getting the the wind farms ready to go, then I think there'll be some more attention paid to um, you know mooring system design. Thank you. I will ask a question if somebody else. I'm, I'm sure we have one in a minute. Um, so I, I actually two questions. The first one is, um, is there much that you have looked at in terms of um, hydrogen infrastructure that is going to be affecting port design and development? So, um, yes, um, <clears throat> it, it's, um, so the, the floating offshore wind farm that, uh, that we helped work with um, up in the North Sea is being utilized for the development of hydrogen offshore. Um, and so from that standpoint, yes, from the standpoint of in the ports, um, the, the development of hydrogen as a fuel, which is, has gotten a lot of attention lately as the fishing, uh, sorry, the shipping industry moves toward decarbonization. Um, the the um, development of hydrogen as a fuel is, is something that can be uh, teamed with floating offshore wind. And there's a lot of speculation that um, floating offshore wind farms will not just be installed to service, um, uh, you know, to provide electrical power, like a power plant would, but also to create um, offshore hubs for the development of hydrogen as a fuel, which can then be um, shipped to, you know, locations where they can be um, offloaded. What I haven't heard yet, and I think is, is and maybe what you're alluding to, is sort of a, a, a hybrid approach in a port to dealing with, the, you know, the, the fabrication and development of offshore wind components, as well as um, hydrogen uh, components. And I, I think that's something that's going to come I'm not sure why this always happens, but everybody sort of thinks of the ports last when they think about um, having to put something out in the ocean. Um, and so um, I, I think that there's still a lot of um, on the drawing board um, work that's happening. But if you look at uh, the North Sea and um, some of the, um, like the high wind uh, demo project, uh, that's an Equinor project, you'll see that Equinor is starting to move towards this hybrid um, uh, approach of utilizing offshore wind to develop hydrogen and um, then looking at the port infrastructure that's needed to sort of support both. Well, related to that, if I just may ask one more and before yes. we see if there's others with questions. Um, so, you know, I, th I think you had probably had a pretty clear view of what was coming down uh, with offshore wind when you did the design on New Bedford, but I guess what I wanted to ask about is the risk factor of designing potentially for New Hampshire, and I know you're going to get to that in, in a moment, but if you design uh, with one uh, kind of potential use in mind and then things change, um, you know, you could be in that situation where if you build it, they won't come. So I, I wonder, you know, what advice you might have or what... It, it, experience you have of seeing how ports have tried to build in that flexibility. Yes, so a really good point and um, something that we've learned. Um, so we, we did try uh, as we were designing the, the port of New Bedford uh, to build some flexibility into it. Um, it. As we have seen over the past five to 10 years as the technology has changed dramatically, um, 
with much and much larger turbines. When we built the port of New Bedford, we were looking at 3.6 megawatt turbines. Um, yeah. Today we're talking about 12 megawatt. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, we were able to, we, we were sent by the state of Massachusetts to go over to the ports of uh, uh, Esbjerg and Grana in Denmark and uh, Bremerhaven and Cuxhaven in Germany. These were the main um, offshore wind ports uh, that were servicing and, and built the, the European offshore wind ports. And one of the things that we talked to, um, for instance, and particularly in Bremerhaven, Bremerhaven was a container and an auto port before it started to add offshore wind to its repertoire. And um, so we learned a, a fair amount of what to do and what not to do um, <clears throat> from the people that had you know, lessons learned with the development of, of Bremerhaven. And you know, one of the lessons is, is that um, because of the um, cyclical nature of the development of an offshore wind uh, industry and, and wind farms, that one may want to have the ability to utilize um, a port for other things. Um, the other thing that one needs to learn is that <clears throat> Bremerhaven saw the genesis of a whole bunch of different kinds of um, foundations that were used. So the port was originally built for these big tri-platform foundations that go in the water that look like big uh, pyramids. Um, and all of the manufacturers that set up shop in Bremerhaven set up to build just those things specially. That lasted for about five years until a different technology came along that uh, the monopiles that um, the offshore wind industry liked better. And the manufacturers of those big um, foundation pieces, you know, all sort of, they either mo um, changed into manufacturing monopiles or they went out of business. And so there was, um, one of the lessons learned is, is yes, you have to build some flexibility into both being able to morph with the technology as it comes along because it's changing so rapidly and also potentially because of the up and down nature, you may need to look at the ability to have you know, multiple uses at a port facility. Um, and so that's, um, <clears throat> that's hard to do, obviously, but um, one of the things you wanna try to do, there's, there's basic things that go into the, the port. I mean, honestly, the, <laughs> we talk about how fancy these ports are, but they're, they're big parking lots, right? And you know, if, you, if you build them right and you, and you make them um, hardened enough so that they can handle the, the use that they're, they're gonna need for offshore wind. They're generally um, useful for other things. Maybe they're overbuilt for those other things, but they can be utilized for other things. And so one thing I would say is New Hampshire is, is looking out. Um, it, it should look at um, not just don't, don't build a port for a project, but look at the longer term offshore wind uses and try to um, build the flexibility into those ports for the, the multiple uses. And, and some ports that are now being used for manufacturing <clears throat> are likely, or, or for marshalling, are probably going to convert to be used for O&M ports for the long term. And if you think about it, you could, you could put two or, three, um, two or three different offshore wind developers with two or three different wind farms operating could all work out of a, a single uh, port that used to be a marshalling port. So it, um, you, you wanna try to have a long-term vision for when you create a master plan for what you're looking at from the port utility standpoint. Thank you, and I'll pause. And I, are there other questions from other members of the commission? Uh -huh. I have, a, I have a question. Jay, this is really useful. Thank you. I'd like to follow up on Diane Martin's question. Um, TLP systems, at least the theory for them, have existed for decades. And um, are, do you think the limitations for TLP systems are in sort of understanding and research, or are they that the industry hasn't actually just been implementing them? And you don't have to go too far in the weeds in your response, but I'm wondering where the gaps are. Well, so I, I was actually surprised as we started to, in, in the last couple of years, delve into um, the details. So there are about 52 or 53 different types of floating um, offshore wind platforms that are being thought of, and about 11 or 12 of those are floating to the top, pardon the pun. And um, th that that's where people, the, the developers, the um, the research has been focused is 
on the actual floating platforms. When we started to talk to the floating platform developers, the floating wind developers and said, well, you know, how are you coming with um, research on your mooring systems? And, and everyone says, oh, well, you know, we're, we'll use catenary systems because that's what's standard. Um, so I, I don't think they've come to terms quite yet with the fact that there is other alternatives that they can and need to be looking at. And it's not that the TLP systems that have been used for decades aren't applicable to offshore wind. Um, it's that I, I don't think that there has been enough focus on the technology transfer um, and, and you know, making sure that, that the, um, those, those systems can perform as well as or similar to the catenary systems that they're planning on using at the moment. And, and I think it's gonna take the industry and, and the states that um, have these applications to sort of force the industry to look harder at how they, how they put these things together <clears throat> um, offshore. And you know, kind of bringing that back around to the port um, and, and the position for, uh, for instance, like a, a, a New Hampshire um, <clears throat> floating systems that are developed and manufactured in the New Hampshire area could include, um, you know, next generation um, tension leg type mooring systems. So um, there's, a, there's an area of both research and potential um, future manufacturing aspects that could be beneficial to New Hampshire um, to make these things work. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I think if, if um, I, I'd like to just get to the, the slides that point out some of the facilities in New Hampshire. Um, I, um, I can take more questions at the end um, if, if there are more on this, but um, I'd sort of like to look at, um, kind of dive down a little bit. Now I will admit here that because um, uh, myself, um, some of my colleagues or, or others are working on some of the different ports. This may be a little bit more generic than you'd like, um, but I can um, pick up on some of this in the questions if you, if you like. Um, but obviously, you know, 17 mile coastline, um, uh, the, the port of Portsmouth is uh, really centrally located to a lot of the offshore wind farms and uh, is one of the areas that has um, industrial port activity. Um, <clears throat> one of the first things one looks at when looking at an offshore wind um, type application is what are the overhead restrictions? What's the air gap restrictions um, between the port and where the wind farm will be? Because that can dictate the kinds of operations that occur can occur in the ports. There's a couple of bridges to, to look at in, um, in the uh, area between um, Portsmouth, uh, or at least up, up the uh, Piscataqua River, um, on where some of the facilities we'll look at are and the open ocean. And so those need to be considered both in terms of how high they are um, or what can get underneath them, but also um, between the, the area between the, um, the, uh, the uh, pilings that are holding the bridge up. Um, that that gap, that horizontal distance is important. Um, maybe not so much for regular ships, but when you start talking about those, um, those uh, floating offshore wind foundations, um, those are wide, right? Those, they have a, um, they're, you know, triangular or big square, uh, very wide, much wider than a ship. And so you have to consider the width and the, um, and the height of what you're bringing underneath the bridges. So you have a, you have a bridge, a um, couple of bridges in Portsmouth um, <clears throat> that are, um, have uh, air draft restrictions um, when they're open. Um, in some cases, you know, a couple of hundred feet. Um, but again, and again, the, the horizontal clearance. Um, we also have, you know, the uh, high draft bridge, fixed bridge spans that are um, potentially between some of the areas where uh, the, um, the components could be manufactured and uh, sites up the Piscataqua River and uh, the open ocean where they'll be installed. So those considerations um, can limit. Um, so, you know, as you saw, and, and it doesn't take a lot of imagination, um, a fully um, erect um, floating offshore wind platform with the uh, tower and the turbine and the blades attached 
is not going to fit under these bridges. Um, so the concept um, of the at least upper river facilities would be this sort of what, what we call a distributed ports network approach to um, perhaps either manufacturing some of the components that are then brought down to outside of the port, uh, outside the, the river area to um, facilities where there are no bridges between the, the port and the um, offshore wind installation area and then can be, uh, and you can put them together and tow them out there. <clears throat> so looking at some of the assets, um, as I mentioned, I'll, I'll start kind of upriver in the Piscataqua River in, in Portsmouth. Um, there are a series of facilities that have um, waterfront um, access and waterfront operations. Some of them are former power plants or, or even operating power plants that um, may be coming offline in the future. Um, and some of them are manufacturing facilities or other um, oil and storage facilities. These are private facilities for the most part, um, but they are uh, not dissimilar to um, the kinds of facilities that are being looked at in the Carolinas and in Virginia and in New York and New Jersey and in Mass and were looked at in Massachusetts. So um, there is there's not a need not to look at these. They have potential efficacy in terms of use for offshore wind, and um, they they could be brought into play. And just because there are bridges between these facilities and the installation sites does not mean that they cannot be utilized. They can be utilized as part of the distributed ports network that um, allows the components <coughs> to be um, put together uh, and then floated out either on barges or as, as floating units um, to the installation areas um, under and through the bridges. Um, so the, there's the Pease uh, trade port and the Market Street terminal that are <coughs> related to Pease. Um, the Pease is obviously not on the water, but it has a lot of opportunity for um, for playing in offshore wind in that there's, it's a, um, you know, it's a manufacturing and, and technology hub. And uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and a lot of the developers look for an inland location near the ports that they're used for development for, um, for the, <clears throat> both the, the technical development, um, sometimes the manufacturing of some of the component parts that go into um, these, these um, uh, wind uh, turbines. Um, there's a lots of bolts and ladders and platforms and computer racks and cables and all kinds of things that go in these things that don't all have to be manufactured at the at the um, or or fabricated at the key side. <clears throat> Certainly, the mega components do because you can't, you know, they don't fit on the roads, nor could they be carried by um, road or rail uh, vehicles. Um, so those you're stuck being on the water, but there are um, potential applications for some of the um, uh, inland areas. Um, and then, you know, um, there are some facilities um, that are in the um, New Hampshire area that have um, open water access and could be a, a marshalling point where uh, components that are fabricated and or manufactured upriver at some of those facilities that I identified earlier or that I highlighted earlier, um, could then be sent down river and um, you wouldn't need a very large um, port area, um, but you would need open water. If you're going to then take the floating foundation and the turbines and hubs and tower sections and everything and put them all into the erect position here for tow out you know, in somewhere in New Hampshire, you'd need to have a facility that was um, outside of the bridges and clear of obstructions. Um, so we've looked at um, for various clients, several different attributes for um, some of the different facilities to see if they would work and would, would um, lay out. And um, there are several opportunities for um, construction and marshalling bases, um, manufacturing of things like blades and also the foundation components um, what's really interesting, if you get into the concrete foundation, um, those are essentially um, big ticker toys. They're, they're built in modular components. So the, the, um, each, there might be three or four 
um, hollow concrete cells that are then tied together by cross members that then the, the turbine is, is uh, placed <coughs> on. Um, those concrete cells can be built as individual components and you don't need the giant lay down and, and marshalling area. They can then be transferred down to by more conventional means with uh, what they call self-propelled motorized transports to the waterfront, to the quayside at that particular facility, and then put together at the quayside, either in the water or um, on one of those elevator platforms that can lower that thing down, that um, component down into the, or the finished um, foundation into the water, and then it can be towed out, uh, the floating foundation. Um, and then of course, service and O&M, um, there's an awful lot of op op opportunities for service and O&M because now you're talking about, you know, something that can happen on a 10 to maybe 15 acre or 20 acre site, as opposed to something that needs to happen on a 30 to 100 acre site um, with the, with the construction or, or marshalling or, or uh, manufacturing. And so there's a lot of the facilities that are available in, in New Hampshire are going to be close to the offshore wind areas. In some cases, maybe um, New Hampshire ports will be the closest ports to some of the offshore wind um, installation facilities. And um, that means that they're um, good candidates for locating the uh, O&M ports. And then the distinction with the service, um, a, a true O&M port, for instance, Vineyard Wind is developing an O&M port in Vineyard Haven on Martha's Vineyard. Um, that they're going to run the wind farm from there and they're going to have crew transfer vessels there to go out and do the daily inspections. But if a blade breaks and needs to be replaced, they're not going to be marshalling that out of um, the port of Vineyard Haven. It's simply not big enough. Um, and so they'll, they will have service support from other port facilities that are um, more on the mainland and on southeastern Massachusetts. And um, that means that there's an opportunity for um, for a port to be a service port. And, and mainly what you're storing there is a, a couple of giant spools of cable, a few blades, you know, a few spare parts that, you know, if you had to wait to have those manufactured in Europe and sent over, you might have to wait several months. Um, so the developers will be keeping on hand uh, some spare parts, I guess is the way to put it. And um, those service ports um, will end up being sort of specialty ports that can service um, the, the East Coast, and they don't necessarily need to be the closest port to an offshore wind farm. Um, they, could they could support several offshore wind farms up and down the, the coast. Um, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about, as I've mentioned, a lot of the other states are moving along and looking at their own port infrastructure um, for offshore wind. And um, I, I know you probably are aware of this connection, um, but there is a, an opportunity for places um, that are in both Maine and Massachusetts to work with the ports in New Hampshire to um, uh, collaborate. Um, and one opportunity for that is for instance, with uh, in Salem, Mass with the footprint power site. Um, if this site were to be developed um, or to be, there's a, there's a power plant there, but there's a lot of um, adjacent land that could be made available. And um, you could envision that foundations that might get manufactured, um, floating foundations that might get manufactured in a port in um, um, New Hampshire, such as you know, the port of Portsmouth or uh, the, the, the Schiller Power Station or one of the other um, facilities that um, we highlighted. Um, could be floated down um, fairly close proximity to um, this location where the top sides could then be put on top because there's no bridge. This has deep water access uh, and there's no bridge clearance issues. And so there's an opportunity for collaboration with ports outside of the Portsmouth region to work together where, where ports in Portsmouth could be providing components or doing aspects of floating offshore wind but um, are constrained so that they can't do the, the full gambit of um, installation and, and manufacturing. Um, and they can work with sister ports, um, both in Maine and, and New Hampshire to, um, I mean, in Massachusetts, to um, sort of complete the constellation of ports that could be part of the distributed port network. Um, 
So, uh, and as I mentioned, um, that collaboration could occur at a variety of ports, go, reaching pretty far down the coast as time goes on. If you advance the, the clock five or 10 years, <clears throat> if you think where we were five or 10 years ago in the US, where we're headed now, um, you think about that same kind of uh, paradigm shift in transition, it's quite possible that floating is being adapted and adopted uh, at, at a number of different locations down the coast. And that opportunity to play within the greater pantheon of um, offshore wind ports in the US is, is very, very solid. And, and keep in mind, you may say, well, is there gonna be enough demand for that? If we're headed toward, you know, it's 35 gigawatts by 2035, which is thousands of turbines. If we're headed toward, you know, what some say is 70 or 80 um, gigawatts, then there's plenty of capacity out there and plenty of demand. Uh, and the uh, eight or 10 ports up and down the east coast of the US or 15 ports or whatever it turns out to be, will all have a play um, if, if they decide to get involved in the, in the offshore wind industry. Um, one thing I just wanted to touch on because this is becoming the trickiest thing, um, uh, we're working with, um, well, at least a half a dozen ports and probably more in terms of helping them with their get designed, get developed, um, look for granting opportunities um, and all those kinds of things. And the, and the financial stack for these um, projects can be very complicated. Um, there, there's a lot of money that, that needs to be raised to bring a, a, a port that currently is used for something else um, if it's used for, um, you know, um, power generation um, to convert that into um, a port that's, that can be used for offshore wind, it, it's going to take a lot. That, all that key side hardening um, that, that I showed you that had to be done at, at New Bedford, um, even if you don't need to do it for the entire water frontage at a, at a site, you're going to have to at least create at least a, you know, a couple of hundred foot or maybe five to 600, 700 foot um, area that's got a hardened key pretty much no matter what you do in offshore wind. And so that's not, uh, that's not something to be taken lightly. And the financial stack um, for developing that, um, that financial play uh, and developing that offshore port has become um, an issue with a lot of the ports down the down the coast. And you probably have heard many states say, oh, we've got this port that's great and it's gonna cost 400 million or 200 million to develop. And that's just gonna happen. And um, the, the, the states are not throwing 200 million or 400 million in cash at these ports. They're coming up with complicated and, um, and innovative financial systems that include in some cases a developer uh, paying in some cases the state um, investing, <clears throat> in some cases the technology developer um, or the the OEM, the original equipment manufacturer, which would be like the manufacturer of the nacelle um, or the blades or what have you. Um, some private financing, um, federal grants um, are being tapped in some cases or being sought, um, I guess I should say, um, or tapped. Um, the the big port in Maryland was able to get a federal tiger grant uh, at one point to assist with its offshore wind development. Um, and then something, a couple of things that are new and I wanted to bring to your attention are blue bonds. And I mentioned to Michael in, in some conversations I've had, um, we are uh, doing some work both internationally through the United Nations Global Compact, recognizing that financing offshore wind and financing the infrastructure that allows offshore wind to happen is tricky and um, that there, a, a global approach um, might be needed. And so there are some innovative ways in which um, these things that are now being called, you know, you've heard of green bonds. Well, these are blue bonds. Um, and so that, that is something worth sort of looking at and talking about in terms of the financing for the, for the, um, for the infrastructure. The, the financing for the wind farm itself, um, you know, the developers have um, come up with various ways of doing that. Um, and what has now become, you know, an issue is not as much financing the wind farm itself, but financing the infrastructure that's needed to build the wind farm. Um, and then... Um, so once you have the port infrastructure, um, I'm sorry, you can't read a lot of this, but um, it basically is talking about what are the, 
what, what are the benefits? Um, once you've got an industry operating in your state, what sorts of benefits can you see? Um, this is some work that we've done with our partners of BVG um, and uh, associates, which are sort of, you know, regarded as experts um, around the world in terms of figuring out the, uh, the benefits that offshore wind can have for um, state and local um, governments and, and state and local areas and the population and sort of the wheel of the different kinds of, um, of um, workers and how that might affect the economy of, of a different area. And it's, it's, you know, it's hundreds of workers in each port um, leading to thousands of workers that are supporting the offshore wind farms. Um, and then, you know, when you start to, to chain that together for a region, that could be, you know, tens, tens of thousands of jobs from a regional perspective. If you think of, you know, New York, Connecticut, um, uh, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire and Maine. And that is where I um, will leave it and open it up to, to some questions again. And hopefully I made the timing that Mike told me I needed to make. Yes, you did. Thank you. Perfect timing. And uh, I really appreciate the focus on New Hampshire then. As I mentioned earlier, we'd hope to have Gina McCarney, Marconi today, but this obviously is a topic that we're going to be talking about uh, quite a bit more because you lay out some of the great opportunities and challenges uh, so well. So let me um, see if commission members have uh, any, any uh, questions? And um, I can't really see everybody in this format. So if you just want to unmute and go right ahead. Uh, Senator Waters, this is uh, Peter Samsich. Go right ahead. Um, I wanted to add uh, two comments. One of them is regarding the assets that were identified for Portsmouth. Uh, I don't want us to forget the railroad infrastructure that we have there that's currently very underutilized, that only the US Navy actually uses it. And otherwise it's not being utilized for much at all. And it's right near the port. So that would be another asset worth remembering. Uh, the other thing was, I wanna get back to your initial comments that you made, Senator Waters, about the hydrogen situation. Um, in fact, just, just yesterday I read about the fact that the Orkney Islands in Scotland, which is supplied by wind farms, discovered they couldn't use all the electricity that was generating. So it has now gone to um, uh, generating hydrogen on site as an energy storage device. And so even, even places like that are now looking into this. And in New Hampshire, uh, well, because we're talking about financing and so forth, um, I think it would be worthwhile looking at the fact that uh, the uh, natural gas utilities right now uh, we should also be interested in looking at the possibilities of hydrogen being produced offshore and as part of their energy supply, both for heating as well as transportation. So it'd be good to have somebody from um, a very from that area uh, give us an update about what what people see as the future of hydrogen in general. Thank you for that, uh, Peter. Are, are there any um, questions for? Yeah. Senator, if I could just if I could just respond um, to that, yeah. because I think there's there's two really interesting points. And um, the point taken about the railroads is spot on. Um, a lot of the uh, if, if you talk to the tower manufacturers, um, they utilize the railroads to bring in the, the raw materials um, and uh, the, the steel plates that get bent, the, all the different pieces. Um, they prefer rail connections to road connections. And so having rail at the ports is key. Not all of the ports that are being looked at for offshore wind have rail. Um, for instance, I showed Brayton Point um, in Massachusetts, which is a, a, a very good port for offshore wind. And as they're redeveloping, they're looking at offshore wind. They have a plug-in point for the um, for the grid there, which adds to its efficacy. Um, but there is no ability to have rail at that site. And so some of the manufacturers have said they really like that site, but they would have preferred it to have rail. So I think that you uh, bring up a really good point that the underutilized rail within the port systems in Portsmouth is something that um, could be an, um, a, a good uh, point. And, and on the hydrogen, I would just um, um, back up yours and the Senator's point. Um, 
that is the hottest thing out there right now is um, hydrogen and, in, and as a subset offshore wind to help produce hydrogen. And um, I can tell you that there's a good sized chunk of our company that is now focusing on the hydrogen aspects. Um, and so it is coming, it's coming fast and, and it's definitely a very good point to think about. Did we have some more questions or comments? Senator Waters, I had a quick question for Jay. And yeah. Jay, I thought it was an excellent presentation. And you ended on a slide that had me thinking earlier, you had a financial stack that you were helping some of these ports think about when it comes to financial investment. What about a permitting or infrastructure stack? In other words, what you had to do down there in New Bedford is staggering. I can imagine the amount of permitting you went through to do that to an oceanfront property. So is there anywhere we can start to think about a permitting stack so that we can get permits in place to allow us to do things when the port actually wants to get involved in building these offshore wind projects? Um, yes. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, so yes, there is, it's a very good point. And um, I think that uh, certainly when we started biting off the, the, the beginnings of the, the terminal in New Bedford, we really didn't have fully comprehend what we were going to run into in terms of our permitting issues. Um, we have, you know, we built winter flounder hotels. Uh, we have um, horseshoe crab mating beaches that we had to create as part of our facility. So there was a lot of things that needed to be considered. The good news is, is that a lot of the permitting authorities or regional permitting authorities, um, like the Army Corps, the EPA, uh, NOAA, NIMS, etc. And so they have, they've been part of the development of some of these um, other ports already. <clears throat> so it's not like when we had the first the first time we talked to a lot of the permitting agencies in 2011, 2012, 2013, they said, what's offshore wind? So at least there is some knowledge base to work from now. Um, however, you, the local permitting authorities in New Hampshire will probably be um, trying to sort out how their normal um, permitting process um, relates to you know, the infrastructure for offshore wind and how that then that ties into sort of what the um, federal agencies are doing. So you, you're exactly correct. Um, there is a fair amount. I would say, uh, you know, too many of these port facilities are giving themselves two to three years to develop for offshore wind. And that's an awful, that's an awful lot to ask of anybody, whether it's the financiers or the, the permitting authorities to sort of say, hey, we'd like to conceptualize um, our port to be used for offshore wind and we'd like that to be operational in three years. That puts, that puts a lot of pressure on everybody. And, and I would say that if you can start thinking now, the, the thing that's nice and, and, and the reason why I told Michael I'd, I'd love to help New Hampshire as much as I can is you actually have the ability and the time you're at early enough stage as you're thinking about this, you can really learn from what has, what has occurred, you know, not only in Europe, but up and down thus far in the development on the East Coast of the US. And you can, you can apply the best practices there and have that, um, that um, you know, the benefit of that experience. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Waters, if I may. Yes, Diane, please. Um, uh, uh, Jay, one of the last slides you showed was what I'll call a workforce development or a workforce needs slide. Um, mm. And I'm wondering, it looked fairly straightforward with engineers and technicians and where do you see the holes in, in education? So if, if whether it's community colleges or universities are thinking about undergraduates, associate degrees, graduate degrees, where are the holes across the US, across the Eastern seaboard? That's a very good question. Um, so there's, there's a layered system. Um, while essentially all of the people that work in offshore wind are considered to be highly trained and, and we're typically talking about highly paid positions, um, there is still a, a whole pantheon of needs. So, you know, the engineers uh, and scientists that are doing the work with, 
you know, the national marine fisheries um, aspects or designing the, the foundations are one aspect. So, you know, certainly universities and colleges and research institutions, and they tend to be the ones that are kind of out in front because that's an early aspect, um, which is the thinking about the design and thinking about the, uh, the, the, the plan for how, um, you know, a, a state might attack offshore wind. Um, but, but then behind that, most of the workers are gonna be involved in fabricating and putting things together. And so there you've got a whole list of technicians, they're skilled technicians, but they're still technicians, which um, uh, in, include um, cable folks that have to, you know, pull and connect cable, um, the, the folks that have to bend steel, welders. Um, welders are in very short supply. Um, fabricators, um, people that can um, just, you know, the bolts that put together, that hold these components together are gigantic. And just the, the technicians that are needed to get those bolts to the, just the right specification, it's a very specialized skill. Um, you, you don't just go down to Home Depot and buy bolts for an offshore wind farm. So you need to, um, th these are all special skills. And I think that there is, um, it, it was a bit of an afterthought down in you know, New York and Massachusetts, um, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and uh, Maryland in terms of the, um, the, the training aspects for the, the full workforce. Um, and I think getting out ahead of that early is something that um, would be very useful. And when you start thinking about it, um, there's very specialized training. And it's not just on the development of the materials. It's on, you know, now you're going to take that bolt that you've so lovingly developed and you're going to take it out to wind farm and you're going to screw it on. So it means you've got to get on this big ship. You got to go out in heavy seas. You got to transfer over to that platform safely. You got to, you know, you have to have uh, training in height climbing, um, harnessing. Um, you may have to be evacuated or, or, um, or if the ship can't stay, you might have to leave by helicopter. So you've got to have training in how to transfer into the helicopter. All of those things that people don't, there's what they call GWO certification training, um, are things that people really weren't thinking about until we started to get closer to actually having offshore winds going up. Uh, offshore wind farms going up. And um, if you, right now, those training um, applications are really in their infancy here in the US. And so what's happening is people are getting trained in Europe and coming over. And, and that I guess is the warning that I would say, um, what we all wanna see besides you know clean energy and offshore wind, we all wanna see the, the benefits that come from the workforce and the jobs and the supply chain settling uh, on our East Coast here. And um, it's, it's that thing that's in danger if we don't get out ahead of it, because what the developers will tell you is, well, look, I've got a workforce that's trained and has already you know, worked on three of these wind farms for me in Europe. Why wouldn't I just put them on a plane, fly them over here, put them up in a hotel for a night, ship them out to these offshore wind um, hotels, and um, we'll just use them, we'll cycle them in on six week cycles. Well, the only way to break that chain is to start getting um, US workers trained in the particular skills that are needed. And then um, apprentice under some of these um, more experienced um, uh, technicians and eventually work up to be the senior technician. It's not that the developers really don't want to, have local supply chain and assist the local governments in building up the jobs. It's just that they have to be mindful that they've got to meet a levelized cost of energy and do things as inexpensively as possible and at low a risk as possible. And so they tend to gravitate toward the experienced workforce that comes out of Europe. And, and that's something that we're going to have, we're going to have to overcome, not just in New Hampshire, but the whole East coast of the U S as it relates to offshore wind. Thank, thank you, Jay. And uh, we have a kind of a hard stop at five and a couple of things to do. Um, I do have a feeling we're going to want to be talking with you some more. Um, I hope that your clients understand that New Hampshire, as always, is open for business and uh, will marshal all of its resources um, from the, the governor's office, the agencies and uh, local businesses um, to you know, work with, with folks who are interested in the, in the port, but you also outline a lot of work that we have to do in, in New Hampshire and probably in collaboration with our 
the other states in the Gulf of Maine task force to uh, get ourselves going. Because as you say, we do have a few years, but um, you know, <laughs> those years will go by quickly. So uh, it's really so helpful to have you with us uh, today. And I, I am sure we'll be in touch. And I, I really appreciate your making the time for such a comprehensive um, presentation to us. So thank you again. Oh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I am actually a native son of, of New Hampshire, uh, was raised there, and I went to UNH, and I'm a graduate uh, in uh, earth science from UNH, so um, I'm thrilled to see this coming along. And as much as I like working in North Carolina, I would much rather be in my home state of New Hampshire, um, you know, helping offshore wind move ahead. So delighted to help in any way I can. Thank you. I, I don't Thanks to everyone. I don't remember you darkening the doorstep of Hamilton Smith Hall too much in any of my English classes, but <laughs> yeah, maybe I saw you in the hallways. <laughs> James Hall was my was where I lived. I was a geology uh, and, and yeah. geoengineer. But, well, thank uh, you again, and uh, thank you, Michael. Um, thank you, and uh, we only have a few minutes um, left, and so I think at this point, uh, Michael, maybe you could just indicate what you think we're likely to do next, and then we'll have a little bit of public comment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, so in attempting to figure out uh, moving forward, best steps where we are engaging the full membership um, and approaching the particular issues in a thoughtful manner and be able to uh, effectively plan out and invite um, individuals to come and present as well on the various topics and give them enough lead time to participate. Um, all of you should have received uh, a, sh a brief document with some of the topics um, that we're looking to, to likely investigate, possibly create some subcommittees to further uh, understand the topics and report back to the commission. Um, given that it, it is November and you know we are getting into the holiday season, um, we had felt like potentially for the December meeting, we actually try and uh, uh, welcome in individuals from Maine and Massachusetts uh, to try and provide some status updates on where they are. Um, I think one of the things uh, that we would benefit from is communication, um, not just in the BOEM sense with our neighbors, but in how they're approaching a lot of their development efforts. As uh, Jay had mentioned, are there opportunities for us to work together? Um, I think, you know, it, it seems to be that there are. And so um, we, would, I think, like to welcome them to, to communicate that, give us some status update. We can provide some to them as well. Um, and so I think that's at least for the moment where we're looking at for December. Um, if, there's, if there's any discussion we'd like to have about that, um, certainly, you know, welcome that as well as any discussion around this, this document that does lay out again, sort of five general topic areas. Uh, and then any specific topics that any of you would like to recommend that we focus on uh, moving into the new year in our upcoming meetings. Um, so uh, with that, you know, I think we'd welcome uh, any conversation. Well, thank you. And um, I, I would think uh, Matt and uh, Mark as well, that we might, after the December meeting, um, start to think about an opportunity to, I'm sure that I'm sure Governor Sununu uh, is going to be ramping up activities of the of his task forces, and just you know, at what point will be appropriate for us to connect with them? Um, we also may hear at some point that Bohm is wants to schedule another Gulf of Maine meeting. Uh, you never know, um, but I think that uh, is something that we want to keep uh, touching base uh, on as well. And I, and I think as well uh, that the collaboration issues here are obviously going to be um, kind of spearheaded or kind of the, 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 those conversations are likely to be at the levels of the governors of the three states, I would think, in terms of how that process, when it matures, um, moves along. Um, so anyways, we've got a lot of things we can talk about, but always wanted to make sure that we are um, you know, adjusting ourselves and having flexibility to what the needs of the governor uh, may be, uh, and also what are the, our our bordering states that we're in the Gulf of Maine uh, task force with. So, thank you, Michael. And because time is short, I think if people have more thoughts on on issues of schedule, as Michael said, to please be in touch with us, and we will 
put it on our uh, next um, steering committee meeting. Um, so with, with that, um, Alan, do we have anybody wishing to make public comment? So if you are a member of the public and you would like to comment or you have questions for the commission, uh, you can raise your hand via Zoom or if you're on the phone, you can press star nine and we can let you talk. And right now it looks like we do have one person who would like to speak. Would you like me to let them in, Senator? Thank you. Hey, Jeffrey, can you hear us okay? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. This is Jeff Dickinson up in Andover, New Hampshire. Again, nice, uh, nice presentation. The whole series has been quite good. Just a quick observation uh, in regards to hydrogen. Uh, experience over a very long period of time in investing in the clean energy sector is, is to limit the amount of innovation wrapped into a particular new system, such as off floating offshore wind. So just a, a caution that hydrogen may be a hot topic again. Uh, however, it might complicate New Hampshire's discussions and planning at such an early stage in floating offshore wind in port development here. Again, just an observation, I've been investing in clean energy for about 25 years. And when you have too many innovations, it, it'll slow things down or create hiccups that you don't really want with a fledgling industry like this. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jeffrey, for mentioning your expertise and also for that, uh, that note, very, very sensible. Alan, is there someone else? Is there anybody else who would like to speak? Again, you can press the raise hand button on Zoom or if you're on the phone, you can press star nine and we will let you speak. Doesn't appear so, Senator. Well, thank you so much, Alan. And um, are there any final comments from members of the, of the commission? Senator, this is Ted Deers. Um, just a couple quick things. One is that I think that um, uh, we could gin up a, a very good presentation on the ocean data portal. Um, I think for a future meeting, I think that the committee might uh, get a lot out of that. Um, it allows them to go see their own data that they'd like to manipulate um, through that system. So I think that's really important uh, of a presentation. And we can certainly put that on the agenda uh, and get that through, uh, you know, through our ocean data portal folks to come and do a quick training for us. So I think that might be a beneficial future topic. And then um, I also happen to be looking at calendars today, and I noted that both the January and February meetings are scheduled on state holidays. So um, you may want to take a quick look at that. If I'm not mistaken, I believe uh, both of those are state holidays. Yes, and uh, we will. We will make the appropriate adjustment. <laughs> um, and, I, and thanks for the, for the reminder about the ocean uh, data portal because um, maybe sooner rather than later for that um, because it will set a context for a lot of the things that we end up talking about and it's such a valuable tool. So thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, Senator Waters, uh, Peter Somsich again. Yeah, uh, representative. Just one comment. I saw a slide that, that was shown um, by Jay previously that showed the naval prison. And that's kind of the eyesore we've had for many years here. But the fact of the matter is nothing's being done with it. And it is located on the water. So maybe it could get a new lease on life. Well, thanks. I, I think it was a generic photo because what's uh, in, under consideration there is the, uh, is the uh, area on the far side of CV Island, where it is a, you know, potential for uh, use for the project, but <laughs> uh, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> uh, maybe they could break up the concrete and use it for the floating pat platforms, huh? <laughs> uh, well, thanks again, everybody. I'll make a motion to adjourn. We do have to take a roll call, and a second. I'll second. Second, and uh, from Michael, and would you call the roll, please, Mark? Sorry about that. Just got to get it up. All right. Hold on. I'm on. I'm in a meeting. They just, <laughs> they just got home. Oh, Senator Waters. Yes. <laughs> Michael Behrman. Yes. Uh, I'm saying yes. Matt Mayu. <clears throat> yes. Representative Bolio. Representative Harvey. Yes. Representative Somsich. Yes. 
Ted Deers. Yes. Diane Martin. Yes. Diane Foster. Yes. Jim Titone. Yes. Tony Junta. <laughs> Guys, I'm in a meeting. Please, one second. Uh, Mark. Van Vadia. Mark. Mark. Yes. Jennifer Sis. Mark. Yes. Jerry Patterson. Yes. Let's get out of here. Uh, kids vote yes too. Thank you, everybody. Great meeting. Good night. Bye -bye. Thank you, Thanks, everyone. Yep. Senator Waters. Senator Waters. Yes. You have a minute. I don't. Okay. Why, you should call me about five thirty if you wanted. Okay. Um. You have my phone number. It's nine six nine nine two two four. Hold on. Uh, nine six nine nine two two 